my loves, and welcome to the Horus Heresy, episode 4. My favourite, one of my favourite books in the entire series, because it deals with one of my absolute favourite legions. I was so excited when this one came out, and I was even more excited to see that Graham McNeil wrote it, because Graham McNeil's one of my favourite of the writers of the Horus Heresy series. Not only that, but Graham's influences are such that he is the perfect writer to be exploring the Slaaneshi side of things, the Empress Children side of things. My big fear for this book was that it wouldn't go far enough. There's often a problem with Slaanesh in Games Workshop where they they can't present like the full scope of what Slaanesh is about for fear of alienating their demographics. Obviously, it's a, it's a universal hobby. It has children in it as well as adults, so it's very difficult to present. But boy, my fears were misplaced, I can tell you. The stuff in this book, there's imagery in this book that is like right near the knuckle. Um, Gray McNeil draws on his influence from, the, he's obviously a Clive Barker fan. That is very clear because there are references to Clive Barker in this book. There are things that characters say that are redolent of what the Cenobites say in Hellraiser. There are, there's even uh, creatures in this book called the Terrata, uh, which are creations of Fabius Bile. And uh, Terrata is is actually derived from one of Barker's books. The Tarata are about the creatures that the Jaff creates from his victims' fears and dreads and desires in the Great and Secret show, Clive Barker's book. So, no fear there. And yet the book is very, very surprising. Once again, you get a shift in focus. After the after the flight of the Eisenstein, which focuses on the Death Guard, you get another shift, and suddenly you get an entirely new legion, entirely new characters, this new rogues gallery of Emperor's Children, and you get this very close focus on Fulgrim himself. Fulgrim is much more of a character in this book than Mortarion was in the last one. They, the writers very, very distinctly attempt to keep Mortarion distant and iconic rather than a psychological character. Fulgrim, they dive right in. They go right into his psychology. He's a protagonist in this book, and it's really fascinating. There's also a lot of setup in this book, which I really like. You, like just like in the first books, like the, like uh, Horus Rising and False Gods, you get to see what the Empress children are like as a legion and as characters before you get the descent into the heresy, the chaos stuff and whatnot. And that is wonderful. That's actually some of the best stuff in the book because it provides such a stark contrast to what comes after. The Empress children, there's so much background here. You get to see not only how they operate in war, which is really interesting, because in terms of their function as space marines, as the Adeptus Astartes, as the, the wages of the Great Crusade, they aren't just warriors. They treat warfare in the same way that the, Al the Alderi do, or the Eldar. They are. They treat warfare as they do, as they treat everything else, as art, as something to be refined. That's their whole philosophy. They are the antithesis of the wor of the world eaters and the space wolves in that regard. Um, they are some of the finest warriors you will find in the Imperium. Some of the finest warriors. Fulgrim um, promotes this notion of perfection in all things, this philosophy of perfection in all things. He acknowledges that perfection is impossible. He gets that. But as an ideal to aspire towards, as a way of refining the self. Um, and they treat their their um, martial arts in the same way they do their domestic arts. And that's really fascinating. So you get these specialised warriors in Fulgrim's armies that have very particular disciplines. There are swordsmen, and there are um, siege engineers, there are tacticians, there are devastation teams, all of whom have very, very particular roles that they fulfil in the most acute and the most pristine way. They make an art out of everything. They flourish everything with perhaps unnecessary ornamentation. They, to see them waging war is apparently beautiful. It's apparently a beautiful act of coordination uh, where everything moves in simpatico with everything else so that there's like a rhythm, there's like a dance to the way they work. Um, it, a lot of the other Space Marine Legions hate them for that. They really despise them because they they are kind of arrogant, you know. They regard themselves as far more refined, disciplined, and as just better than the other Space Marines, um, which they are. But, you know, there's not much argument against it. By and large, they are. Um, 
another thing that you see, which I really fucking love and was something I, I was desperate for them to go into, which they do, is their domestic lives. Unlike many of the Space Marine Legions, the warriors of the Emperor's children aren't just warriors. They're like the Thousand Sons. They're like the Word Bearers. They have other lives. They have other aspects to themselves. They Fulgrim encourages his children to engage with the other sides of civilization and culture and society. He encourages artistic discipline, phil- philosophy, architecture, music. So they are not only superlative warriors, they are scientists, they are geneticists, they are surgeons, they are alchemists, they are painters and musicians and singers and poets and songwriters. They are way more human than the vast majority of all of the other legions. And that I love. I absolutely love. It's one of the reasons I love this legion almost as much as any other. Alongside the Thousand Sons, they are my favourites, the Emperor's Children. But it also it, it suggests this really wonderful thing, because uh, uh, Fulgrim actually talks about this in the book. He is looking forward. His utopian vision is stronger than perhaps any of the other Primarchs, maybe even than the Emperors. He looks forward to a time when the fighting stops, when his legion can help in the raising of temples and museums and art galleries, when they can actually be creators of civilizations and not just destroyers of them. He, a lot of the time, when they wage war, the first thing Fulgrim does is engages in parley. That's part of his philosophy. He tries to charm and to philosophize and to debate rather than wage war. Waging war is the last step for him, as it is for Magnus the Red, as it is for Lorgar. He's more of a peacemaker than a warrior. Uh, but as a warrior, he is so strong because he is this disciplinarian. He's a martial artist. He, and he's not just a martial artist artist in one discipline. He can perfect almost any weapon that he picks up. He is, amongst the Primarchs, he's very well regarded. He could take on almost any of them one-on-one and probably beat them because he's so fluid, he's so fast, he's so he marries so many martial arts together. Which, of course, you see. You see throughout the heresy, because he actually kills two Primarchs. Um, does, well, almost kills two Primarchs. Kills one definitely, and wounds one so profoundly that he's in stasis up until the present day of the Imperium. So, yeah, he's tough. Even before he becomes a Demon Prince, Fulgrim is tough. But he's also this other creature... He doesn't like the warfare. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like the rampant destruction. He doesn't like the genocide. He finds it to be wasteful. He finds it... He re- particularly hates it when he has to destroy something beautiful. And that that weighs on him heavily. When they have to destroy a civilization or a society, it really does weigh on him quite profoundly. And that's kind of the key. That's kind of the way in for his corruption. Um... It's fascinating. I love that side of it and how that becomes the pathway in. It's the same with all the traitor Primarchs, it seems to me. There is this very subtle pathway in to what stirs their doubts, what emphasizes their their lack of certitude, which eventually leads to their fall. It's really cool. I like Fulgrim as a character in a way that it's almost impossible to like a lot of the other Primarchs. The fact that he's also p- supremely beautiful helps a great deal. He, uh, all the Primarchs are to a certain degree, with the, the exceptions of the likes of uh, Mortarion, Night Haunter, and Angron. They're just intimidating. The others are sublimely beautiful. They're angelic. But Fulgrim is like the, the epitome of that, the apotheosis of that. He is... He's like a painting come to life. He moves with this impossible fluidity. He's always beautiful. He always looks beautiful. It's like, it's almost blinding looking at him by all accounts. You can't, mortals can't even be in his presence without falling to their knees and sort of groveling in front of him. Um, It's quite impressive. It's quite incredible. But, and the way this the way the book describes their fall is really interesting. You already have characters in The Emperor's Children who are not necessarily bothered about the Imperium as a vision. You've got the likes of Fabius Bile. And Fabius Bile is already way more concerned with his perfecting of humanity, uh, with his genetic manipulations, than he is with any vision of the Emperor or the Primarchs or whatever. And he's kind of a key to the corruption here. The rot has already kind of begun with him, and with characters like Eidolon. 
Eidolon is one of the lieutenant commanders of the Emperor's children. And he's consumed by his own arrogance and by his self-superiority. The likes of Lucius, the uh, who will eventually become the Eternal. Um, he is also... He has sort of put aside or distorted the philosophy of perfection in the name of narcissism and ego. And that's where it starts. That's where it comes from. It's the way Horus works on Fulgrim. When he's parlaying with him, Fulgrim already respects Horus more than he respects the Emperor. He absolutely adores Horus. That's made very clear. They're very close. They are like some of the closest brothers imaginable. So Fulgrim is actually quite ready to engage in the rebellion he's quite ready to engage in the rebellion but he doesn't really know the full extent of it he doesn't really understand the the degrees and the depths to which it will go and in order to facilitate that horus gifts him a blade he gifts him the Lairon blade um or rather the uh, the anathame blade and there's um and that's where the the corruption towards chaos starts. But there is also something else. There is a war that's waged against a an alien race that when you when the way they're described, they're called the Leiran. And when they're described, you can tell that they're Slaneshi in nature. Their whole culture is Slaneshi. They even embody they look like what Fulgrim eventually becomes, the the many armed serpent creature. That's the the Leiran look like that. They look like humanoid serpents with four arms. And that's what Fulgrim models his eventual demonic form on. But from that, from their world, from the Leiron world, he actually takes a blade, um, the Leiron blade, which is, of course, it's the centre of their culture, but it's also a demon blade. It's possessed by a demon of, um, of Slanish. And as the demon slowly, insidiously works on Fulgrim, his artistic inclinations become obsession and he becomes more extreme. He becomes more obsessed about things. And that leads on to deeper, more perverse, stranger appetites. And it's, it's very slow, it's very subtle, but it starts to spread. The rot starts to spread throughout the Emperor's children. And eventually they become this fleet of maniacs of like unbelievable excesses and it's it's described as like the stuff they do is unbelievable they're the human populations of their fleet the remembrances and whatnot who are also affected by this they basically they expire through the excesses that they experience they like it doesn't it doesn't describe it in these terms but they like drug themselves and drink themselves and gorge themselves and fuck themselves to death it's unbelievable and the emperor's children start to experience this too they start to they start to take their martial arts to the nth degree it becomes um a, a, the thrill of it more than the artistry of it becomes more important to them they start to become masochistic they start to mutilate themselves they start to the sensation of self-excoriation of burning of of cutting themselves of even mutilating themselves and hideous hideous surgery starts to become commonplace and eventually the fleet just becomes this heaving Clive Barkerian mass of hideousness. It's it becomes just unbelievable. It, it, the descent is is slow, but when it explodes, it explodes. You actually get the first noise marines here as well, as a result of technologies that are taken from the Leyran society, but also the the uh, workings of Fabius Bile. Fabius Bile basically creates the first noise marines, um, and when they when they take to the stage uh, in the Emperor's children's ships, there's this great scene that's like a it's like a great it's like a um, a theatre. It's like some sort of operatic or symphonic display. And when the noise marines take to the stage, it's it becomes this massacre. It becomes this insane orgy of ear-shattering, eyeball-bursting, skull-splitting noise. And the demons of Slanesh actually break through at that point, and they, they move and dance amongst the audience, uh, just enacting a, a, a lunatic uh degree of sadism there's lots of very 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 near the knuckle imagery here 
that's very Clive Barkarian and goes much deeper than I ever thought it would. It goes much, much deeper. Um, I mean, earlier on, there's actually this really interesting scene where the Eldar, the Eldari, they foresee, the, well, the Eldari of Ulthway in particular, they actually foresee what's going to happen. They actually have some idea. And they think that Fulgrim is the more approachable of the Primarchs because they know that he does engage in parley. So they actually do parley with him. Unfortunately, he's already carrying the Leyren Blade and they see it and they know instantly what it is. They know instantly that it's the corruption of the great enemy, that it's Slanesh and that it, Slanesh already has her claws in Fulgrim and it becomes this war so Fulgrim actually kills both a, an Eldari Wraith Lord and an Avatar at that point he actually manages to kill an Avatar you know um, and there's nothing they can do the the Eldar of Ulthway really try but there's nothing they can do they see that the corruption's already there and they foresee that he's Fulgrim himself will become a great bane of their species in the the not too distant future which of course we know he does we know very well that he does but there's this real madness in Fulgrim at this point uh, by the end He's actually fully possessed. The demon... There's this wonderful thing that happens throughout not just this book, but all the books in the Horus Heresy that um, include the Emperor's Children. There are these literary references, and in the Emperor's Children books, it's Oscar Wilde. There are these Oscar Wildean references and quotes, and um, even some, some of the latter stories are even named after Oscar Wilde's own stories. Um, in this book, it's the, it's the picture of Dorian Gray. There's a painting painting that a remembrance makes of Fulgrim. That is, there's something occult about it. It's almost too perfect. It's Fulgrim to the nth degree. And the demon of the Leyran blade actually does take Fulgrim over. He allows it to um, during the drop site massacres of Istvan V. And the reason he allows it to is because he is fighting with Ferris Manus. Now, Ferris Manus is the Primarch of the Iron Hands, and what's established in this book is that Fulgrim has an incredible relationship with the with, with Ferris Manus. And the Emperor's children have an incredible relationship with the Iron Hands. They're very close, in the same way that the Thousand Sons and the Word Bearers are, but even closer. They have this incredible relationship. Um, and Fulgrim tries to turn Ferris Manus and fails. He absolutely fails. Ferris is implacable. He will not turn. And Fulgrim overestimates his abilities, basically, as a um, as a diplomat. He completely overestimates his own abilities. And as a result, they end up fighting on Istvan V. And Fulgrim can't do it. At this point, he can't kill Ferris Manus, even though he's the superior warrior. He has him, and he can't kill him. So the demon takes his place he calls out to the demon and the demon floods him and basically shunts his soul into the painting so at the end of this book fulgrim is left screaming in this painting in a kind of limbo state and now the demon has taken full control and is in authority over the Emperor's children. Fortunately, I mean, it's no spoiler that this status quo doesn't last. Fulgrim does eventually reclaim his body in, in the latter stories, and we'll get to that. Um, but it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. You, this act, this piece of the story of Fulgrim being possessed actually isn't part of the original Emperor's Children background. Of all the legions, the Emperor's Children have the most changed about them in terms of established background. For example, in the original background, the Emperor's Children are not one of the first legions to fall along with Horus. They aren't at Istvan III in the original um, story. They're sent alongside the Raven Guard, the Iron Hands, the... Night Lords, the Word Bearers, and the Iron Warriors to fight, to parley with Horus at Istvan V in the original story. And that's where they're corrupted. But of course, that doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work for this new background. So their story has changed. And they're actually one of the very first to fall. 
Not only that, but the, the details of in the original background of Horus being possessed are actually given to Fulgrim here. They're shunted over to Fulgrim. He wasn't possessed in the original story, but he is now. Um, fascinating stuff. Sets up a lot going forward for what the Empress children are going to be like. And also, um, just like the Death Guard, here you see just how deep the corruption of Chaos goes because they, the, the Empress children become unrecognisable as what they originally were. By the end of this book, they are this heaving, lunatic, disorganized mass of gibbering nutcases who are all burnt or mutilated or surgically transformed. They look like Cenobites, you know, they're all open and weeping and set with jeweled pins and hooks and whatnot it's absolutely insane even some of the other traitor legions when they see the emperor's children and what they've become are put off by them quite profoundly and they're also one of the one of the uh legions that embraces chaos in its entirety very early on very early on um their fall starts earlier and ends quicker um or goes to goes to the depths much quicker than some of the others. I mean, some of the others don't even know they're turning to chaos. Like, the World Eaters in their books don't even know. When Angron ascends in Betrayer, he doesn't even know who Korn is. He has no idea who Korn is. Um, whereas Fulgrim, yeah, because of his experiences with the Slaaneshi demon um, in the painting, eventually, yes, he knows who uh, who and what Slaanesh is. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating book. It's very well written, and it goes to some real depths, this one. It goes to some extremes that I never expected the Horus Heresy to go to, even with the the Emperor's Children and the Slanesh stuff. There's some of the imagery in here that's absolutely insane, particularly amongst the remembrances of the Legion, when they really start to go, when they really start to fall to the extremes of Slanesh worship. Some of the stuff they do is insane absolutely insane it's very cool it's a very good book uh one i would slap a warning label on if you don't like your extreme imagery like your horror imagery then don't read it because it's re it does go there it really does go there there's some nasty stuff in this book um which is why it's one of my favorites obviously it's a crossover of two of my favorite 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 things you know clive barkarian extremity and warhammer 40,000. i mean can't go wrong really um so yes that is Fulgrim, book five. Next up, book six. I will see you then. Bye-bye.